Hello. <laughs> it's an odd title because it doesn't actually say what it says. This is running a company. I'm going to talk about running a company like you run an open source project. I better mention about my background. I'm a veteran developer. I've been writing for years. If anybody goes back with personal computer world far enough, you'll find a chap called David Evnell writing in it. That was me. <laughs> I used to edit the H Online, which just did open source and security. And currently, I ended up, well, I ended up a Compose writing for them, and they got acquired by IBM. Now, Compose was started in 2009. They used to do the open source MongoDB database and host it. Now it does lots more da open source databases. Everything the company does is pretty much about open source, apart from the fact that it, it delivers a service. IBM came along and bought us in 2015. But the big thing, and this is what really sold me the company, was the unique company culture. It's terrifying. And uh, let me this slide here. Right. Now, first question is, why run a business like you'd run an open source project? Open source projects turn out to be one of the more innovative organizations out there. They're self-forming, complex organisms. They're interesting because they develop around people, not around organizational structures. And that means that they can be agile. Not agile as in just some having a regular scrum, but able to react quickly or slowly, depending on how it feels, to changes in business. In conditions around it, whether or not people want um, the product that they're making, or whether people have decided that there are, uh, there are problems with it, whether there's security issues, whatever happens, they don't, they're able to carry on doing what they do without leaping off and becoming something else. Now, if you can do that with your company, you're in a great position. You can adjust to whatever condition the market throws at you. But that leads to the question, what actually is an open source project? What actually makes an open source project interesting? Well, we could start with the code. Shared code is the thing that everybody thinks about when they think about open source. But it's that act the way people share code with open source that makes it different. It's how it is produced is the interesting thing in terms of organization. It's driven by desires. Whether you want to make a great business, or whether you want to create a great piece of software, it's all about a desire. And in open source, it's the desires of the contributors. There's rarely uh, an external organization saying, you must make this this way. It's what the contributors want to do. So you might want to make a better X, a freer Y. Free is quite a common one because there are so many proprietary products out there. You might want to just give it to the world in a way that they consume it. It might just be to solve problem Z. There's so much open source out there, which is just somebody sitting down and going, I have problem Z. I cannot do this. I will solve this problem and I will make it open source. They may fulfill needs. They may actually have no needs at all to be fulfilled. They may just be complete nonsense as a piece of code. But most of all, they all these desires f have a wider scope. They're not just about the code. They're about what people want to achieve. In some ways, the GPL, uh, the license, is an embodiment of a desire to have freer code. Yeah, and vice versa, open source itself and all the various licenses are expressions of that. So you have this concept of desires driving thing. There's one common desire, though. For any project, the common desire for it is to make the project better. It's to do what is good for the project. You don't want to break it. If anybody comes along and wants to break it, you've got a problem. It's not a common desire, but they're probably not on your side <laughs> in the first place. Ladies and gentlemen, my first true Scotsman fallacy. Um, the important thing is that those desires are held by collaborators. Let me show we're not running together. Collaborate as holy desires. No one is made to work on something they don't want to. If you hear of an open source collaborator being made to work on something they don't want to, call the police. They're probably, <laughs> probably being held against their will somewhere. Collaborators work 
to, to their own goals, to fulfill their desires. It's all this virtuous loop which works very nicely. At the core of it is collaboration, though. You have desires, but you can't achieve those desires without collaborating to it with others. And that needs a mutuality of interests. A mutual set of interests, and if you want to embody it, that's what an open source project is. It's a mutuality of desires, of interests, that is embodied in some code and an ecosystem around it. It's a lovely thing when it works. Yes, it's a loop. It's a huge loop. Your desires are embodied in a project. People join the project and add their desires to it. They pull it all in, and the desires change as they learn. Yeah. No open source project goes through life being exactly the same thing that it started out to be. This is why we have versions. They mark changes in desires being expressed in the code. This is why you have, you know, for example, Python 2 to Python 3 is one of my favorites. It was a huge change of desires. Not everybody shared the same desires. Everything split. But as time goes on, experience is gathered, the project evolves, the code keeps coming out, and the desires are embodied in the project again. And we have this virtuous loop of learning. Now, there's no structure in most open source projects. You might think there's people marked with particular privileges and things. The collaborators organize themselves. And they, there's a whole folklore around how they organize. I'm going to pick out the big magic word which everybody rolls out. It's meritocracy. <coughs> it's this idea that position in the structures in an open source organization is determined by some virtual merit that people may have inherited from elsewhere or may have assumed it from some other part of the universe. <coughs> but in reality, ladies and gentlemen, today's word is the resultocracy. People are judged by the results that they produce within a project. Whether they be good or bad, it's the results that count. And it's their work on the project. This is why when a project starts and the person who wrote all the code is there presenting the project to the world, he is automatically the leader of the resultocracy. He has all the results. The next contributors will diminish and lower his power in the resultocracy. If somebody produces a particularly brilliant piece of code which radically changes it, their position in the resultocracy goes up. And it's this notion that we only judge people's positions in projects by their work on that project. We do only their work on that project. We don't care, we don't know about people's other work. If somebody over there has written a, hey, the world's great HTTP parser, but he's now working on our networking code project, don't care, doesn't cross over. If he writes great networking code, that comes through, and he moves up in the organization. If he writes rubbish HTTP code, is Resultocracy power drops on the other side. It's all about independently valuing people. You know, there are people, you have come across many situations where you look at somebody's code and you go, that person has done great work on this project. But boy, when they did this stuff in this project, which they're out of their field, it's, it's just don't go near it. As I said, project founders tend to lead, or at least lead initially, because they create all those results. Of course, this does actually generate a little thing. Results have success or failure associated with them. One terrible thing that some open source projects do is that they use that as their primary metric, not whether or not it was done with good intentions or anything, but whether or not it just worked or didn't work, which can end up making Collaborate is more averse to actually taking a risk and doing novel things. Now that gets interesting behaviors, which open source allows for forks, where people just walk away with the code and go, we'll do it differently. Or, and this is the worst one, the project gets the life slowly drained out of it because nobody wants to take a risk, especially big where you have projects which have become quite big 
and have a lot of people relying on them, and nobody wants to take that risk of, say, changing fundamental block A because they can make it better. Collaborators, though, agree on leadership. Nobody leads a project without the consent of the collaborators, even the project creator. If the project creator irritates the hell out of all the other collaborators, all the other collaborators with open source can take their code away and develop it elsewhere. So it's always by consent. So when somebody is supreme leader for life, or whatever, of the code base of a project, the chances are that everybody's pretty much behind them is embodying their desires for that project. Yeah. So it's the supreme leaders for life. It can end up being a number of people, where there's a whole bunch of desires that have to be worked out and agreed on. Or it may be broken down by task. It's leader leadership by consent, by force. Open source forces that consent. There are other styles of open source projects. I'm not mentioning them right now, because they're on the next slide. Company-centric open source. I've written a bunch of code as my company. It is essential to how the company runs. I am about to throw it over the wall as open source. Enjoy. These, they're not very collaborative. These things come over the wall. People rarely collaborate on them. I can name a couple of projects, for example. I'll pick one of my favorites, MongoDB. MongoDB's code is open source. Most of the changes, nearly all the changes, come from inside the company. Yeah. Structure, how the management of the project is created, is usually imposed by the company. They'll sit there and say, yes, we've got a technical, technical leadership committee who will tell you how we're going to lead it. If you're in the company, it doesn't matter how much merit or results you have, company wins. They fix it up by hiring the people who do really well, if they actually do produce results, and hire them. But it's the company has desires, not the individuals contributing code, and the company defines the leadership. It's an odd creature. That kind of project we're not talking about. We're talking about the organic projects. The other one is code that's gone through foundations, like the Apache Foundation and um, so far, Linux Foundation. They tend towards collaborative because they're trying to bring people together, but the foundation will usually bring a process and structure to them, which people have created. And it may be company-centric source, opening up is not what we're talking about. The interesting exception here, because it has so much momentum entering into a foundation, is Linux because it, it had already fully evolved this entire hierarchy. Boom, through we came, and basically all the Linux Foundation you could do was go, well, oh, there you go, Linus, have a check. <laughs> so, not talking about those, but it's worth knowing that there's a difference. But here's the bit where we come around. What's this got to do with running a company? Key lessons, empowered participants. That's people involved in the project have a power. Anybody involved in an open source project can walk away with the entire project and start their own version of it. Self-forming structures, non-imposed hierarchies. People are really good at wiring themselves together with each other if they're prepared to collaborate. If they're not prepared to collaborate, you're wasting your time, but you hopefully find a group of people who want to actually collaborate. And they will form structures. They will make those mechanisms that make things work for you. They all should be sharing common desires. Yeah? As well as their own desires, bring a set of desires to them. And they all share in the outcome. When that big code release happens, everybody gets the code. They all share in the outcome of the project. So. How do you apply those ideas to a company? Well, back in 2009, when the original founders of Composer getting together, they thought, let's try this. Let's try and run this as much like an open source project as possible. So it starts off with, do what is good for the company. Now, this kind of could be a tenet of capitalism, but in a collaborative environment, the company is the project and you do what is good for the company. And the company has you know, a need to, it has to enable that. It has to let people 
do good things for it. First place we start off, and this is where we started off with the composer, was we made it a flat organisation. An open source project is a flat organisation. Nobody really has any hierarchy above each other. Everybody has the same capability as each other, or the access to similar resources. So anybody can do what they feel is best for the company. That's not ask permission to do what's best for the, for the company. That's not ask permission for what to do best for an open source project. When you come to an open source project, you don't go up to it and go, right, what do you want me to do now? Unless you haven't got any desires at all. You come up to it and you say, I'd like to do this with it. And you go and do it. And you set a direction. So let's do it with the company. When new developers join, we don't tell them what to do. We drop them into the ecosystem and we say, here, here's what's happening. Where do you think you can make the most difference? Some of them join in existing structures. Others, right here, and we had this a couple of weeks ago, turn in and produce a whole new block of code which suddenly solves a whole bunch of problems that nobody would really be paying any attention to and fixing things. They motivate themselves. They locate the problems because people are really good at that once you've given them the information. So anyway, we made the company a flat organisation. Anybody can do what they feel is best for the company and structures can still form. If eight or nine people, four, eight or nine people in the company think it's a really good idea to have some sort of checking mechanism between each other on the code they commit and how they do it, or another group think that a particular tool is right for them, they can form structures around that. But you don't impose structures. So you start imposing structures, you say, yeah, no, 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 your opinion doesn't count. <laughs> so people can form the structures. There's no hierarchy to work against. There's no magic trapdoor. It's hard to do. Yeah? I'm not going to say it's easy. A flat organisation is really hard. The founders especially, it's hard on them. When you form a company, the founders are going to have the direct personal investment into it. They have to balance that with actually keeping the flatness. Yeah. And that means that the, some of it could end up with them just sitting there going, yeah, okay. <laughs> if you think that's right, you know, I trust you. But top of the list is anything that happens should happen through agreement, not conflict. There shouldn't be a fight and people ending up on either side of it. You should encourage an organisation which agrees. And to agree, you need to, to make good choices. A company folklore here, pitch perfect. It's the official company movie of Compose. Anybody joining the company is made to watch pitch perfect. One of the top lines in it is make good choices. You need to understand what the company is. When you join the project, an open source project, you need to understand what the open source project is. You know, if you go along to the Apache web server project and start trying to make it into a chocolate truffle making machine, you're not going to go far. Same basic idea. You need to understand the current desires of the organisation. The current embodiment of the project, as you see it in the code, may not be the exact current desires because they will have evolved. You need to have all the information you need. And all the information you need is a lot. And you need to be able to act on your decisions and act on your desi desires. And more importantly, you, be, you need to be able to fail and succeed. So, understand the company, it's what means understand what the company does. In a project, it's usually in the code. And that tends to have to be communicated by the founders. That's one of the founders' big responsibilities, is to communicate the desires and what the company is. So, for us guys, it was, we want to be the best company that does X. We want to be the company that frees developers from messing with databases and to get on with writing applications. That was actually a statement that gets drummed into people at the start of things. You, we want to do it by doing Y and Z. For us, it was making it all automated and self-service. Expressing, yeah, you know, these aren't mission statements. Mission statements are horrible things because they're, they're not expressing desires. They're expressing where you're going. These are desires. They're wants. You 
Here's a scary one, transparency. When I arrived at Compose, I was told, here you go, here's all the information. The company has to be completely transparent. If you're going to make a good choice, and that includes allocations of resources and financial power and anything like that, if you're going to make a good choice, you need to know all the information. A lot of the time, companies keep that information from employees. For example, how much other employees cost. You know, you, you have developers sitting there going, I, I don't know how much he gets paid, you know, but yeah. and, 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 and she must be on a dreadful salary because, you know, she... she and, and, and they, they, they over there are working for peanuts. So when we get them to do the work, you make terrible this one. All the information of an organization needs to be available to people to make good choices. It's scary and it's honest. It is actually a blocker later on, I'll mention one of the problems with it. But the important thing is good decisions cannot be made without good information. If you do not know how much a project team, to put together a team to do a particular project is going to cost, actually cost, you can't make that decision. You cannot handle other people as abstract cost centers with no numbers against them if you're trying to help people to come together and do a thing. So you have to be transparent. Also, you need to be able to act on those decisions you made. Most open source projects don't have gatekeepers. They have protection against malevolent forces, people coming in and dumping crap in the code. But most of them don't have gatekeepers. They have pull requests that are people confirming that something was good. But their big thing is that they let code in. It can be reverted. Yay, version control systems. <laughs> but with, if you have gatekeepers, if you have somebody saying, no, you can't put that in, that person has more power than you. The organization is no longer flat. All the power distorts. People can't do the things they need to do. It's a power, and it creates an inequality. It's a very scary thing when you sit there in an organization, in a company, and somebody says, yes, you can put a pull request in, and even on most of them, commit to master without anybody looking at your code. You won't do that, though. <laughs> just in case everybody's panicking in the back. You won't do that, though, because you have to trust people. You hired them. You have to trust people are doing the right thing. It may be for the wrong reasons, but that's a mistake they could make any time. Things go wrong. But if you can trust people, you don't need gatekeepers. Trust is important, and if you can't trust people, why did you hire them to become part of your organisation? Yeah. You have to assume that they are people that you believe in. And when it does go wrong, and it does go wrong, sometimes it goes so horribly wrong that you sit there going, oh, oh no, it's not going to be right ever again. When it goes wrong, <coughs> be supportive, because that's what the company's about. A company's about, you know, in the same way as an open source project, it or when a work, open source project works, everybody should rally around and help fix what went wrong. If you have a project that descends into blame storming, as soon as something goes wrong, <coughs> you've already got a problem with the project. Yeah, it's a cultural underlying project. So you be supportive. You remember that you trust these people. Unless it's obvious that they've gone and violated every bit of trust you've had, the chances are that they were doing it for the right reasons. And most of all, you learn from it. And you don't learn, don't trust them, and don't support them. <laughs> you avoid learning the anti-lessons there. All through this, now one thing about Compose, I haven't, oh, all through this, yeah, communication is key. Compose is entirely remote. We have no offices. We have offices that IBM tells us to go to now, but we don't go to them. We're entirely remote. But you must make sure that the communication flows. People must talk within the organization. And that includes the nonsense and the chatter. If you start trying to turn any channel of communication into a sterile thing, you will be in trouble. There's nonsense chat on the, all the best mailing lists for all the best open source projects. Yeah. They'll filter it down and they'll be, they'll be responsible about it, but there will always be nonsense chat that turns up. Just make sure that everyone makes sure the flow is healthy. Here are some scary. If you're empowering people to do what they need to do, 
we do things like unlimited vacation. I'll say now unlimited vacation doesn't work because you actually have to tell people they have to take at least so much holiday because you end up with a situation of people so dedicated to the project that they do not leave. <laughs> they do not leave. Yeah, you have to make people. But what you do is you give them the freedom to take it when they want it, whenever they want it, at whatever notice they need. So, for example, if for tomorrow I don't want to go and do any work tomorrow, I just say, I'm not in. You trust people to do the right thing. If you don't trust them again, you can't do it. No set hours. People do the work when it suits them, especially when you're an international organisation. When you spread around the world, let people adjust their times. So it works. At the end of the day, results are what counts. The resultocracy is back. It's results that are important. And trust people to deliver. And more importantly, trust them to balance their work lives. That work-life balance is really hard to get right in most situations. Enable people to get that balanced. You might think, hmm, yeah. is that open sourcey? Well, it is. You work on an open source project when you want to. Yeah, you, you, you can walk away from it, and you work on it for as long as you want to. If you don't want to work on it, you can walk away from it. You have no commitments, apart from those clinging emotional ones where they guilt you into it. And when good things happen, and this is the important one, this is a huge one, when good things happen, you share it. When that big deal comes, the exit happens, or whatever, you share in it. And you share it with the employees, with the people who've put their desires into it. Because it ain't equity, you know, equity and stuff doesn't cut it. You, sh you know, share directly. Because the worst one is you share equity with people and things completely out of their control go weird and the equity's worth nothing. And people feel bad about it. And you suddenly sit with their company and not doing anything. I'm going to wrap up. Why do this? Why make your company work like an open source project? Well, at small scales, management hierarchies don't work. You cannot be the entire reporting line for everybody. That's it, yeah. Companies need to be agile and able to react. The best way to be agile is to make your entire company a nervous system that is ready to react. And because the best ideas come from people who are motivated with the power to make things happen. Yeah? If they're not motivated, they're not going to have the best ideas. If they can't make anything happen, they're not going to have the best ideas, and they're not going to be motivated. There's reasons not to do it. That's it. <laughs> it's really, really hard to do. Yeah, the, uh, you talk, it, 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 it's, a it's a stressy thing for the founders. It's complicated, and it's a constant balancing act. It's really easy to pick up a management book and go, yeah, we'll have a couple of line managers and a HR unit, and we're done. It's really hard to hire. Hiring means you have to hire people you trust. A compose, we blind hire, up to a point where we then bring them in and they work for a day with us. And we give them a hard project that looks like real work. Yeah? And they sit with the developers working on that project in the remote environment for a day. And we see how everybody feels at the end of the day. It's a very rich, complicated thing. We've been written up in, I think it's Fortune, it's one of the big mags, actually came around and saw our pro process. It's like, huh? <laughs> We're bringing it into IBM. Yeah. For the tricky jobs, it's an interesting way of hiring. But, again, it's hard to scale up. You will hit a point where this is hard. And here's the interesting point. When you've done this, the counter against that is, when you do need to actually cut up the company, you trust everybody in the company at that point. They understand how the company works, they understand the orientation, so you can actually break things up sensibly with people you trust all the way through the body. If you do get acquired, yeah, with this kind of culture, you will have to fight every single battle again. Be prepared for that, unless you want to be small and sustainable, which a lot of people will do these days. If you want to be a small, sustainable organization, this is a great way to go. If you want to go whoosh up for the exit, then be prepared to do things the hard way. So thanks for listening. It's, yeah, I hope it's enlightened you in some way. <laughs>